Good morning. How are you? Can you guys hear me okay? I can't hear, but good. Well, thank you for having me back here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having Sunpath here today and tomorrow. My name's Tom Parker. I'm one of the engineers at Sunpath. Um, we're doing a couple of things today. First, I want to actually thank <coughs> Gary for getting me out of trouble. I got here, but my equipment, my everything I own didn't get here at all. It might be here tonight, so some good is there if it does show up. So we're going to use some uh, equipment, which Gary got for me last night. Thank you very much. And uh, do a short PowerPoint presentation. There's only about four or five slides. Um, Rick had asked me to bring some information, technology, some new ideas from some part to talk to you about. And I'm all about that. I love technology and creative ideas. Pat's like, no, Tom, you can't bring anything to, PA, to BPA because we have PA in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And we're actually launching things there. So I did, I cried, I begged, I pleaded, and no, you can't take anything, which is probably good because the stuff got lost. Um, <laughs> So I do have a couple of slides to show you where we're going to go, what we're doing right now. And there's a little teaser slide at the end to show you what will be at PIA. Anybody going to be going to Texas next week or next February? No? You're all invited. Please come over. But um, you'll see that now. So the few slides I've got are things I saw last year. You guys see as riggers in the field a lot of issues, a lot of bad rigging techniques. Um, so I picked on two which were kind of scary. And what I've learned, last year, do you remember I left that little thing with you, the first domino? If you don't allow the first domino to go, the next one won't go. Okay, so if you can use that, it's really good. Well, this one I'm thinking of when I tell my guys at work is if you think it can happen, it will happen. And it's very true. So I'll show you this. Um, I do want to still have some sort of discussion with this. So if you've got any things you found in the field or concerns or questions, more of a discussion point between ourselves as riggers is really going to be helpful. Okay, this one I had to mock up because I didn't take photographs of it at the time. And we have mock-up dummy bags so we can actually resize containers quickly and efficiently. Um, this is a TJNK. This came in from a rigger in Pennsylvania last year, a master rigger. And um, <clears throat> he was talked to a few times. So it looks quite normal. Anything there standing out right now to you guys? Yeah, it's pretty normal. Here we go. So there's two slides there. And he thought it would be a better idea, more efficient for function, if he S-folded the bridle and put all the bridle under the floor plane. I think it's a cracking idea. Um, again, like last time, if you have ideas and want to join the R&D team, please do, but share it with us so we can help you. Because sometimes we've already figured out that's not going to work. Um, especially at a low altitude, probably not at a high altitude either. And there was about 18 inches of bridle left out to the pilot chute. So what would happen, the pressure of the free bag pushing down against the floor plate would have contained the bridle from extraction anyway. If the pilot chute had got clean air, it would have hesitated at a minimum. I think it would have been a tabletop total for sure. Um, I was quite surprised to see it. In my career, I've seen a lot of things. Never that. <clears throat> Any of you guys ever seen anything like that? You guys follow the manual, you take suggestions from the manufacturer, and you follow it. And again, if you follow the manuals of every manufacturer, they'll support you when it goes wrong. But when you do stuff like this, like you're on your own, good luck. Are you stitching that down now? <laughs> <laughs> I spoke to the rigger personally, and um, he's a wonderful man. And for us, it's about education, you know? We need people to work with us. So education, do you want to come and work with us? We can show you some techniques, we can, you know, we'll, we'll We'll pay the cost, let's do something about it. So we did all that, <clears throat> he was quite happy. But then he was taught by another instructor, that's how we like to do it. Very out of touch with what some path are actually doing. As you know, the website with the manual on will be the most current version you can get, and you can print your own one off. So that's just one slide. Um, so please, I suggest you don't try that. It doesn't really work. Now the next one, I've heard about this since I've been rigging professionally. Anybody heard of suck through? Suck through. Made up name? Mm. Here we go. Everyone's got their own version of that one. This is a family show. The gasp in the room. Okay, so <clears throat> this was in France last year. And um, the instructor I spoke to on the phone, who I know and known for quite a while, is English. So that helped. And Here's another photograph of it. So we received an email with these photographs on, and I wouldn't say it was panic, because with engineering, you don't want to just react. You want to actually get the facts. 
So we called the driver's and I got the uh, owner, who was French, of course, and I didn't understand him. He didn't understand me. So the, the uh, instructor got on the phone, and um, it was kind of weird because he said, once I finish interrogating the student, have you ever heard that before? <laughs> so he was a student um, um, cleared off to go and jump on his own and had his own version of accounts. Well, they couldn't make two and two make four. So he was interrogated, apparently. And what happened, he was a, a large student, out of control, tumbling. And he was on his head, going very fast, panicking at deployment. So what happened here was we figured out, we think it was his right shoulder, what was very low, or the angle, asymmetrical, when he deployed. And of course, the force wasn't strong enough to break the type 2A. But the force was strong enough to actually relieve the yellow cable, the low-land cable, back out of the housing here, here, and suck it through back into the grommet. Of course, you can't cut this away. You're stuck to what you got, and you've got to make the best of it. But the force is quite a lot to do that because it was asymmetrical. And things what can cause that, even in a kind of symmetrical way, would be if the risers were not correctly installed, if the configuration was incorrect. If the housing itself, um, I do it for show rigs. I kind of get some of the black tape and put it over the housing to make it all look black. It's not a very good idea because the housing has to elongate at least by an inch through deployment to keep up with the, the placement of the grommet on the riser. So if the housing's in the wrong location, and it would have been if it was down low pushing forwards the other way, it would put pressure on the loop in the back and that would cause the cable to come through. I've heard about it for over 20 years. It's the first one I've ever seen. Um, nobody at some part had ever seen one before, but that is what we call suck through. So, this is a large ring system, yeah. So, it's really because <coughs> this was the risers were fine for intolerance. Um, the only thing we replaced was the yellow cable, the cutaway cable. And um, again, through the interrogation, they figured out the guy was tumbling and uh, he, he panicked and deployed, which is what you should do. You've got to get the parachute out, you've got to do something. And um, but it caused that. So, the stars aligned, the forces came down to that yellow cable, and it, it pulled it out. They bent the housing grommet back in place. We sent the new housings regardless, and uh, they went forward with it, which is fine. But that can happen. I brought it to show you because I've never seen it before. I'm not sure you guys would have, but it's called suck through. And again, if you're looking at your equipment, checking the three rings, checking continuity, checking housings, che checking everything's in the right spot, you'll probably never see this again. And I just wanted to share that with you. Uh -huh. Engineering the future. Okay, so that's the title for the PA symposium for SunPath this year, which is good. It's just about as far as we go with that. Um, so SunPath have four full-time engineers. We have two satellite engineers. Um, one's an aerospace engineer in Canada. The other one's a marine engineer in Annapolis, Maryland. So we're working on new technologies, new ideas, concepts, things like that as we grow our team, which is really good. And SunPath have been excellent in throwing money into the engineering department. You know, it's not that like we can't spend it quick enough, but they're supporting innovation in different directions. And again, at the PA Symposium, you'll see some of that or on the videos or on the feeds. And um, there's one thing at the end, it's a slide at the end, which is a tease of where we're going to go. You guys are probably going to figure it out. I'm not going to answer. Do we answer. all need to start saving our money up now? Yeah? I would. <laughs> I, I, I love it. I love it. Um, I normally give away one or, three jab one or two free javelins a year, so just stay in touch. Um, I'll get away with that, but no more. So um, a couple of years ago, um, we all started drawing in 3D, the engineering department, because um, I know with Pat, she's very visual. She wants to see things before she wants to give money or direction or time to it. So when you try and explain to her, you guys have a show called the Lion's Den. What's that show where they go and pitch ideas to those expensive? Dragon's Den, where well, it's like that. You go into the conference room and everyone's around the board and you get five minutes to pitch your idea and you hope it goes well because you're really keen to get the income, get the money it's for funding. Dragon, huh? She's a beautiful dragon. <laughs> and uh, so it's kind of similar to that for me and my experiences to get things moving forward. Um, so with 3D drawing, we can actually show them very cheaply what they're going to probably get in real time. So we've kind of leaned that way in the last couple of years. So everything we do now is in 3D. And last year, um, Sunpath bought a 3D printer. You guys are probably used to 3D printers. Um, ours prints carbon fiber. It's made by um, Mark Forge. It's called Onyx. And um, it's like carbon fiber chips. It looks like a, the lead of a pencil, and it comes through. It's very accurate. 
It's about three times stronger than plastic, but it's good for rapid prototyping. So again, for a small cost of time and development, we can see the product in our hands the next day if it's a longer print and decide if we go forwards or not before we ask for funding or things like that. So that's actually made a big change in how we actually go forward with ideas, um, getting money, responses from the board to make sure we're going in the right direction, and they can actually see something tangible before it's like, here it is, we spent $50,000. Yeah, I don't like that. And it happens, it really does. I mean, we did a rig a couple of years ago. We spent, whew, it was over $100,000, a concept system. And it was like a car, when they build a car, a concept car, they take little bits from it now and then. It's not the whole package you always get on the street. So the same thing with our rig. We built a concept rig, cost a lot of money, and we start to slowly dig into it and take little things because the time's right to go in that direction. So here, this is a 3D printer. Inside the cutaway tube and the reserve tube is an aluminum tube. And uh, it's called the Fat Daddy tube. There's one for the cutaway, one for the reserve. So we have two different tubes. Well, we want to consolidate that to be efficient because they can both do the same thing as one. So we can draw it, we can print it. Um, this probably costs us $1.50 to make it and probably takes us about two hours to print. So again, it's quite quick, it's rapid prototypes, it's cost effective. And there's nothing we can't do. Um, since we've had this, there's been many people asking for phone cases and things for their car, and <laughs> it happens. Actually, guns too, it's America. <laughs> can you make a Glock? <laughs> so um, it does this, which is great. And you'll see here, there's the original aluminum, aluminum, and uh, there's the carbon fiber prototype beside it, so you get a comparison. Now, the thing about carbon fiber, or that technology, is that the weight difference. You know, the cost might be a bit more, we're not sure yet, we're working it out. That's why I have an, um, a marine engineer who works with composite materials working that stuff out for us at his time. So it's ongoing R&D. But if we can save a weight in a system, um, especially in the military areas, I mean, that's a lot of things they can do with that. So we're going that direction. We're not sure if it's going to work or not. We're looking at titanium too. So other materials, what we're just, I like to get away from what we've always used. And uh, so we're putting some time and effort into ex expanding you know, what we know and um, making a better, better system for the new technologies that are out there. Uh -huh. There's the slide I'm not going to talk about. Are you susceptible to bribery at all? Yes. <laughs> Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm turning this off because I'm not answering questions. <laughs> On this. But if you come to Texas, you can see it. We have about four new things we're going to show. And um, they are beautiful. They re I'm very proud of them all. I really am. So do you have any questions um, on rigging, techniques, things you've seen in the field, even other systems you can share as a group so we can all learn and move on with that stuff? Any questions at all about that? No? Just me? What's that problems? Thank you. He's got a microphone coming. Uh, yeah, on um, some slightly older uh, reserve containers where it's not lined, I'm finding a lot of um, containers, not just javelins or wakes, where the urethane coating is turning quite sticky. Yeah. Um, I've contacted some manufacturers about this and they said, you know, try washing it and so on, it hasn't made any difference. I believe the uh, French um, uh, manufacturers say to dust it with like French chalk. Mm -hmm. Not that satisfactory. Mm -hmm. um, I have, in conjunction with some path, lined one or two containers myself. Mm -hmm. But is this something that you would do on a regular basis if people uh, send them back to you and so on, or is that not viable? Yes and no. So, um, as a community through the PIA, is also is that this discussion points come up for the last two or three years. Um, as far as the degradation of the, the coating on the back. It changes depending on the environment, the coating. There's no specification for the coating. So the manufacturers can pretty much make whatever concoction they want, and we get left with that. And now we're seeing after time, it degrades. It becomes a sticky problem in the free bag or on the reserve number two flap. It can hold against the, the, the pilot chute, the reserve, which we've had 
two recorded in the last year on the charcoal fabric, which we're monitoring. Again, we don't react, we monitor and we do our best. The first thing we're always going to do is ask you to wash it. But the newer systems um, are lined with foam or power pack. The ones that aren't lined, is it worth lining them? Maybe to the customer, and we're happy to assist with that. Um, but typically, you're going to get that over time. It's going to happen with the older systems, and they're probably going to go away, as long as it's not detrimental to the function. And that's the important thing, is it going to work properly? But we're trying to get away from coated um, free bags. For the last two years, we've been working in R&D with the um, F111 and the non-coated Oxford cloth, which is the white fabric you guys see today. And they're good, and they're, well, they're all excellent, actually. It's engineering approved by a small margin, the F111 over the Oxford cloth, because it was actually easier to pack. Um, there's issues with that as far as our end with stamping, how the, how the ink bleeds into the fabric so we can read it in time, things like that, but we kind of covered that now. And then I think last week we just got a new batch of non-coated um, Oxford cloth in to retest a different supplier so we can actually go down that path to make it easier for us and for you to not have a coated product in the field. Um, the containers are all lined now on our end. We do suggest if that's the case to wash it and if not we'll pick up the slack and do what we have to do to make it work, um, even with the cost. So it's very far and few between, but we are seeing it slowly now coming back into play with older systems. You're quite right. But if you're not comfortable with it, do not pack it. It's important that thing works. And I always think about it, you're at 700 feet and the Cypress or the AED is going to kick in right now. Is there anything stopping that thing leaving your back? I hope not. I hope it's not tacky. I hope that didn't get packed with a bridle under the floor plate. I mean, there's things that haven't got to happen because you're not walking away from those situations at that altitude because you haven't got time. So as riggers, you know, I think it's really good to see that, monitor it, talk to the manufacturers, and then see how we can assist you to make sure it's airworthy and safe. It's a good question. Thanks. Any other questions? No questions? Are you sure? OK, one there. Okay. You want this? No, he wants it. Oh, sorry. Um. For jumpers over a, a certain weight, do you recommend uh, that they use the large ring risers, the standard risers? <clears throat> we do. So on student rigs, we make it mandatory pretty much to get large chest straps, type 8 chest straps and type 8 risers. Um, the new website will be launched pretty soon. It's been done again. Um, we're only allowed to do um, certain combinations in, in the choosing of that. As far as a weight, I think it's just common sense. Um, I've spoken to PD about that with canopies and where they draw the line between micro line and Dacron and things like that. Um, I'm quite a big guy. I mean, I want to jump small rises because I think it's cool. But <clears throat> again, it's down to the ENGs that really we can't tell them, but we'd advise them to go with you know, a, a Type 8 riser. As far as a weight, I don't know. Um, I mean, what do you see as big? Because the TSO allows 300 pounds. And I think at that point, you should be, you know, anything over. 220, 230, let's be looking at type A risers. I think that's fair enough, I really do. Um, not too common we get that question, but it's probably where I'd pitch that argument, for sure. But again, you've got to stay inside the TSO, and people do try to step outside of it as the exit weight, and there's probably two or three times a year that I write letters explaining what the TSO means to us, and that they're breaking that is void if they continue to want to purchase this equipment. Because we won't just sell you the gear, because we get your weight on the order form. So if it adds up to being, you know, 301 pounds, you're going to hear from me because it's just not the best way to go. But it's a good question. Thanks. Do you have any other questions? No more? Okay, good. Well, if you get any, please uh, come back this afternoon as question and answers with a, a whole team of us. That should be great. Um, I'm going to pack this parachute now, which I'm really excited about. <laughs> I'm going to leave you a secret. So normally when I come unprepared. I bring my favorite parachute, my favorite tools, it's all lined up for success. This would be a first for me, which would be great. And um, so they've asked me to pack it from bagging to closing, because all you guys know how to flake the parachute. There's nothing there I can teach you. And pretty much you guys are as good as me at it. So we're just going to stretch it out. It'll take a few minutes. Um, turn your chairs, please, to get yourself some room and uh, get a good vantage point. And uh, we'll bag it and close it and answer any questions at that time, too. Thank you. So for time, I'm just going to take it out of the free bag and put it back in. Um, Josh packed this glass, is that correct? I believe it is. We call him Sparkles. He came to PD, uh, 
some part for about two months and built his own rig and Pat gave him the nickname Sparkles. And it stuck, obviously. So um, he did very, very well. And please move around, guys, so you can see if you wish. I'm going to make a loop. Do you guys have any questions about tying loops? Any concerns about tying the loop? Why is it a good idea to change the loop every time? Wear. Sorry? Wear. It wears, yeah. There's three major reasons as far as I'm concerned. What do you think they are? One's wear. Two, Stretch. yep, it's the length you want. So you start out with the length you want. That's right. And the third one, this is so well organized, I'm not used to it. The third one is you put it in the system through the cutter yourself. You didn't rely on the guy last week to uh, not do it. It's happened before. So I think every time, change the loop. Make sure it's brand new, so it hasn't got any damage. The damage comes from the temporary pin, bad techniques, things like that. It's the length you want, so the finish will be correct. And you put it through the cutter so you can sleep at night. Make sense? Okay. I know you guys have all heard this before. It doesn't change too much when you, you do it right every time. Okay. How much of the tail do you like on your loop? I leave the loop, the tail, just as the manufacturer cut it. I don't, I don't cut it off. I just tuck it away underneath. Um, so AirTech, they have a manual how to thread this through. Okay. So I follow their recommendations. And I don't remember seeing anything about a tail length, so I just leave it. I mean, I think you can if you wish to, but why? It's not necessary. If it's not necessary, and if it was necessary, there'd be some documentation on it for sure. But you can always call them for that answer, because they're the experts in that. Um, if you find you're halfway through your paint job and the loop's a little bit long, what do you do? My favorite, which I don't do, but I see a lot, and if you guys have ever done it, shame on you, is right with the bridge, because you can be to the point with Britain. You know, in, in, like in America, you've got to kind of dance around it a bit more. So the, uh, the favorite one is to bring the loop back through like this, get a bunch of this tail, so if you cut it off, you can't do this. So, <laughs> so keep the tail, put the tail through the back of the loop, and hey, look at that. My loop's now a little bit shorter, so I can keep going. Is that correct? Is that the right way to go? Why not? Exactly. It's not in the manual. So just do things by the book, and you can't go wrong. Because it's been packed for a while, I'm going to pack the loop a little bit smaller. Um, Adjustable, adjustable loop. Yeah, it's called elastic. <laughs> okay, so to be fair, sure. So there are systems on the market which, which allow for that. Um, the finger trap system, uh, the racer, the one pin teardrop, things like that. The quick loop, they call it. Um, with a javelin. It's not necessary. We haven't put any time into it at all, to be honest, as That's far as I can remember. But there is a rigger in Hawaii who packs a javelin with a quick loop. Um, and you know because the tail sits up here. So you see his tail sticking out. So a couple of times you know, in the last five years, they come across the, uh, the repair department. I oversee all rigging. I oversee the repair department, technically. And I see this thing come through. And you know straight away it's a quick loop. Well, it's because he can't maintain the pilot ship being in the right place, he then explains to the customer, that's how some path want it, so I can put it back down. And it's really completely against what we want. So there is one person in the world what does it at least, with a quick loop on the javelin. Do not recommend it, do not do it, it's not necessary. Um, you will get the riggers saying, well, leave it a few days or a few weeks, it's gonna settle, there'll be a gap. There won't be a gap. If it's packed correctly, it'll be the same 
tomorrow in five years and ten years. So just be aware of that. But you are, it's a good question, but as far as our system, it's not necessary. We'll go with that. Okay. Question and, regarding that then. You put so much time, effort and money into developing that system there, Javelin, and yet you rely on an external component from another manufacturer. Why is that? Yeah. Okay. So AirTech did all the R&D and testing since the, before the 90s through this for this type of loop and for the washer placement itself and how it gets put together to make it easy and function every time. So that's really not where we're about. TS-112 is a technical standard for um, integrating or allowing the integration of an AED into our system. And there's a battery of tests to go through. So AirTech and a few others have passed those tests, which is a PIE spec. And um, that allows us to feel confident with the loop, how it functions every time. So yeah, we, that's their department, it's their area of expertise, so we trust in that. Like they trust it's going to work in our system. But there's, there's TS-112 is the testing parameters for that, to check it will work. Um, it was getting crazy with the Vigil and the AirTech, because depending on what the, what the customer ordered, we have to change the loop, the washer, and the pocket. So a couple of years ago, Jeff Johnson, one of my teammates, we developed, well, he developed the universal pocket. So you'll see now a non AAD pocket from a manufacturer, you'll see some past version, which is approved by both manufacturers or all manufacturers who are involved. Um, but we still use their washer in their loop. Um, and we use our elastic now as well. So it was done, you know, controlled with their, with their help. But yeah, we do trust in this, absolutely, if that answers your question. Okay, any other questions? So I can say that again. If you have a cutter jam on an AAD, uh -huh. it's not going to deploy on most of the systems that are on the market. And that is the only kit that probably would still work okay because it cuts the bottom of the top. Yeah, I mean, there's old, there's old versions what are pin pullers. This right. actually cuts the line. There's some which were not cut in the line correctly. They're not used anymore. Um, this will actually, this is called a 7x7 seven seven reserve cable. Have you seen the reserve cable? Yeah. Um, seven strand. It's the same as aircraft wire they use for ones. This will cut through that like a hot knife through butter. Yeah. Have you ever seen that done? Yes, I've seen that actually. Yeah. Actually. You're saying the design of that is that it doesn't rely on the cutter clearing anyway because it's still manually deployed. Yeah, yeah. it Correct. It's manually deployed. It's a backup device when all else fails. Yeah. Um, but you don't want that to fail. It's got to be functional. And mm -hmm. I've never heard of any hookup or bad cut on the system what's in the marketplace today. What's current. <coughs> yeah. Back in the early days in Quincy, when they first started doing the uh, air tech, they would take a dummy at like a seven in the morning and throw the dummy out the plane at 500 feet with a cypress on it, or whatever altitude they set it for. And every morning, pop, the canopy came out just to kind of support where they were going. That was in the early days, it was quite good. Um, so it's a wonderful system. Do you have a pull-up call, please, Gary? I know you... One more Just, yeah, pull-up call. Oh, there's one. Thanks. <coughs> You ready? Yep. Let's do it. Any volunteers? No, not one? Room full of riggers, not one volunteer? <laughs> Unbelievable. So if you've been to these before or seen the videos or talked to me on the phone, I normally have two paddles. This one's quite soft. It doesn't, it doesn't do any damage, so I'm quite happy to use it with the fabric. But normally the metal one's for pulling, the wooden one's for manipulating the fabric. Go from oh, sparkles. I'm going to call you up. <laughs> okay, 
I know you guys probably can't see. Have you all seen the manual? Okay. Of course, the foundation, if you get this part right, it gives you somewhere to go with an excess fold to keep things square and horizontal. If you build a brick wall and you put bricks on top of each other, it goes straight up. If you put them like this, it falls over. That's what I see in packing today. People put the excess fold on top in a different line. It's not the same as the bottom, and uh, it can cause problems. <laughs> it's a little different starting from here, but uh, we'll do our best. Anybody not use the long split air method? You guys all tried the long split air method? Comfortable with it? Happy with it? Scared of it? A little bit, a little bit yeah. Okay, so now I'm just going to treat this part as one parachute and a lot of people get very aggressive here and they shouldn't, it's just take your time, the canopy will fold exactly where you pull the tension, like so. Pull up under tension, bring it back to that, this line here and here, like so, line it up. And that's my ear. Again, starting from here is a bit trickier. Okay. The safety stone. Let's talk about a safety stone. How important is it that it's not damaged or broken? Sure. Very. Why? It's Sorry? It's the main thing that holds it all in. Yeah, if this breaks prematurely, guess what? The canopy stays on your back and the pilot chute goes away and does what your pilot chute does. So it's important. You can't make it yourself. It's one of the two things we don't want you guys to make as qualified riggers at any level around the world. Um, because the elastic changes throughout the roll. We actually reject 50% of our elastic because of that. So it goes through testing. And um, that way we can control that because we don't want a weak piece of elastic from the local sewing shop going in there because you guys can get out of trouble quick, okay? So just give us a call, we'll send you some. Okay, so with the ear, off, up, in, down. Off, up, in, down. There's no real magic in getting it in the bag. It kind of has a struggle like I do with the 126. Just get as much as you can in the right ear first. And then the left ear. Okay, I know you won't, but all you lot go this way, <laughs> if, you, if you want to see. Okay, so from here, I'm taking the, I was only joking. Okay. You can see here there's a little bit left in the bag, there's a little bit left outside. Um, the reserve free bag from here to here is, you wouldn't believe it, but it's the same size as the reserve container. So when people say leave stuff outside the free bag, all it does is extend the free bag outside the container itself. So you want to get as much of the canopy into the free bag as long as it's compatible. If it's not compatible, you probably shouldn't pack it.
you guys are quiet. Okay. <laughs> and this is the, the paddle work coming up, which I think is really good to master because it saves you a lot of work um, and it makes things go where you want them. So we're gonna take the paddle, we're gonna push it down so we can see it at all times, into the first S fold, the bottom ear, and push down. Then come back out into the first S fold, and again, work it this way and then this way, and slowly left and right to get it in, like so. So that's into the ear. I'm going to push it down, come back, find the first test fold, push in, rotate the bag. What you don't want to do is keep rotating the bag. <laughs> and because we have the split here, we can go from both for both sides and the center, like this, and just gently push the fabric away. And what you're doing now is making room for the AED, the bridle and the pilot sheet to sit in that pocket later on. But again, with this size canopy and this container, you have to keep working it the whole way. It won't ever give you a break. On larger systems, you just do it once and you can leave it. But on the smaller ones, you work a little bit harder, but you work smarter with a paddle. I load my ears up, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially when you've got a 126 combination, you want to use up every cubic centimeter in this thing. You really do. Because there's height to the bag, too. It's a little different because we didn't start from the beginning, but it should end up pretty close. And can I suggest a wooden panel for this part? But the more you do here, the less work you do later on. And then here and here, it kind of bows out like this when you pack. You ever seen that? You want to try and clear those away because then the plastics on the side, on the side flaps can come across and come down. If they don't come down properly, they kick up at the back and it helps hold the pop top higher. So you see a gap. And that's coming because the fabric sitting here, especially with the sky hook, there's a lot of things to put in this space. So from here, I'll just rotate it in and get it as close as far as possible. So it's your goal to get the to touch? Yes. Yeah, it is. If you think about it in thirds, the distribution through loading, through deployment, is perfect. So if the grommets are stretched like this, what's going to happen? The chance could be out of sequence deployment. It wouldn't be very good. So yeah, if, and if the elastic is weak, it may not touch, it should be very close. It should be very close. Remember, it's the first domino you're trying to prevent. Okay. Any questions on that so far? Wonderful. Yeah, consistency should be the same the whole way up. Yeah, for sure. There's no real trick to this apart from getting the lines to pay out backwards. So when you bring the lines across, I rotate my wrist. So this, this segment of the line comes out first. Otherwise, it will cross over in the bag and cause friction and damage. And all of a sudden, you don't have any canopy above you but a bunch of lines, possibly. So um, always make sure you do that. going to run a little bit long.
Divide you with one piece and not two pieces is one less tool to carry, one less tool to count. And I went over the top of the lines with the Velcro protector because I can come cleanly off without disturbing the line group. If you go underneath, you may disturb the line a little bit, which slows you down. It's just not the best way to go. I think most people go over the top now. Excuse me, okay. going to be fun. Um, I'm going to turn everything around so you guys can see. You guys see okay? Can you see? Okay. We call these dog ears. Um, keep them out of the container because if they go in now, especially with the RSK, they're really hard to get out afterwards. Completely impossible. Do you guys ever get slack over the yoke when you finish with the reserve risers? Do you ever see a little gap there? To help that, what I would suggest is pull the risers away from you and pull the yoke towards you like this. So you pull the risers across the top of the yoke, pull the actual harness towards you as well at the same time from the yoke. And that makes it nice and tight between the ring and your hand. If you don't tuck the housing away, it can come across and fall right underneath the AED switch. And it will cut the plastic vinyl, then it will break the switch, and then it will cost you a lot of money because I did it. So tuck that thing away. <laughs> Okay. So from here, I normally use a thousand pound spectra line. This one's been finger trapped to make it thicker in the middle. Um, AirTech do, su do actually suggest to use this. The reason why I don't is that we've already gone through the cutter. We haven't got to go through a side flap grommet through a cutter or it's a combination. There's loops already through the cutter, so everything above that's clear. With a wider um, line, it's easier to pin, temporary pin, and work with the system. But I can leave that up to you. There. Okay. So to prevent the closing loop going around the cutter and back up, which happens quite often, have you ever seen that? You ever heard of it? Well, the sad thing is we've seen two of them at Sunpath and they closed the rig, which means the loop was too long to start with. They got away with it. We tried to replicate it. We couldn't. We'd break loops but we did simulate it and we had two spare cutters so we fired them and we got two fires out of two which doesn't really tell you anything but it did work but to stop that from going around there it's pretty simple you just keep tension on the pull-up cord when you drop the bag in so as I drop the bag, this isn't slack. A lot of people just drop this down and try and mush it into the back and that causes the rotation around the cutter. Keep tension on the loop, like so, and just put the bag down, placing the grommet over the cutter. Check, always check, and you haven't got around anything like so. 
Again, keep working that fabric into the back. On the side here is the binding tape. I'm going to use that with my fingertips to push it down into those corners. My lines are a little messy. Okay. And then spend time here working the free bag into the container. I will go in again with the paddle. And open up this channel again. Because with the RSK126 combination, it's going to want to close every time you move it. Anybody not packed a skyhook? Did I ask that question already? Anyone not familiar with the skyhook? Okay. Do you know how it works? We'll meet afterwards. We'll go through it if you wish. Um, so this has a skyhook. So if it doesn't have a skyhook, how do you wrap the bridle? Sorry? Under the floor plate. Yeah, under the floor plate. <laughs> no, you write it the same way as if it had a sky hook, so there's continuity to all the systems. So if the javelins are 1997, 95, 94, it doesn't matter what year it was built, they go to the new configuration of bridle routing or anything what's in the manual you should follow. In the case that clears that up. Yeah, under the floor plate. Yeah, talk amongst yourself, guys. It's a bit boring. So I'm not going to split it evenly because there's three layers or four layers here with the Type 4. It gets quite thick. On the smaller ones, I go for evenness, not numbers sometimes. On the larger rigs, it doesn't really matter so much. So I'm going to take one across. So I've got one, two, three. I've got two here. <coughs> I find it easier to put the green loop into the pocket without temporarily pinning it. I like to keep the pin away from the reserve. Come on, you know you want to go in there. Come on. They normally go in very easily once they've been packed once. This one, not so much. I'm going to assist it. Now the red lanyard, <clears throat> that goes across the top of the skyhook. It shows you on this little map here to go that way. If you go underneath, it's wrong. You should do it again. It's going to work 99% of the time, but it goes across the top for a reason. So it comes across the top, open up the Lexan, and slide on the loop. What is the reason why you configured it that way? Because through the testing to get approved from for the skyhook system, we had it underneath, and then on one of the malfunctions, spinning backwards in a certain rotation, when, it, when the bridle let go, it would throw, it would slingshot off the red loop. And um, so we put it on top, it stopped that. So it's really quite simple, um, just to help maintain it on there longer to go through its process. It came off. So that's why there's a map there to show you gone the right way. Sorry, what's the question? I've often wondered if it was more of an impedance to the, just the reserve come out if you just pulled the, hand, the reserve handle as opposed to cutting away. No. The functions have to work separately. So nothing can stop the function of the reserve. It's a primary thing to save your life. So with the main stool being in, this must have worked perfectly without it. So yeah. the skyhook works if you have a main canopy out. But if you don't have a main canopy and the pilot says it's 2,000 feet, the engine fell off, get out. You can go out on the reserve and the reserve will work normally. Yeah. And the reserve will also work normally if something breaks in the, in the, uh, in the skyhook system too, or go back into a regular deployment. So it worked, they're two different systems, but it's one system to work with both. Okay, okay I've heard this bit before, most of you, but there's a few new people. What is this? Come on, you can get this bit right. Safety thread, what does it break at? 
Gary, you're going to hate me. Where is he? I'll send you some. <laughs> it's, it's for the cause, it's for the cause. Okay, so, <laughs> thank you. So, um, I was in Brazil a few years ago, and most of you guys have heard this like five times, like here he goes again, a Brazil story. But they were packing tandems, they have sky hooks. The rigger there was in charge of the committee, for the new committee they were making. And they found it was five cord, they used five cord harness thread to tie the sky hook in place because they want to make sure the red loop doesn't come off. I mean, it's really smart, but again, the bigger picture is you can't land a reserve pilot chute. And the next day we found out there was, there was fishing line, wax thread, and five cord being used across the country. So use safety thread. E-thread on the sewing machines is the same color. It looks the same. Can you use that? No, why not? It's too strong. Yeah. Okay, come on. I'll leave it a long tail, it won't do any damage. I like to take the snips away from the reserve. Thank you. Okay, so here you want to clear the bridle away from the grommet. Give you as much room as you can to get this subflap down. The sky subflap wants to go down as far as possible. I'm going to keep not talking anymore, keep going fast. <laughs> the, um, that's going to help. So, dress the bridle. I put my knee gently onto the sky hook. Don't press too hard. That plastic leg sand can break and will break. If it does, don't panic. There's um, retrofit sleeves what get slid on, so you can replace them, but they have to be replaced. So it's always the way I was left first, which is this side. Then the way I was right. And you'll find if you use a, a larger diameter pull-up cord, it'll be easier on your hands, especially when you pack quite a few a day. Okay, one final time, go inside and clear away the fabric, making a hole for the bridle and the pilot chute. I'm going to push down into this lower corner to fill that up, like so. Okay, good. Any questions so far? Not one? You're saving them for later, aren't you? Remember, PD love answering questions. <laughs> So I'm very particular about this. I don't like seeing that little S-fold. It creates bulk. So all our bridles are cut to length, of course, but we have a tolerance of plus or minus two, 50 millimeters because otherwise things could get rejected. So depending on the container length, the bridle folds differently every time. So I'm just going to probably adjust that to see if I can get the grommet to sit right where I want it first time. better but not quite good so now when I pull this up to here this will just sit straight up is what I'm looking for I don't want another s-fold it creates bulk and things go wrong when you get bulk okay because this is six layers thick this trifold it's six layers think of it that way okay so I'll put one across so two, four, and there's actually seven layers on the right side, the left side. 
On the pop top, you'll notice there's a runoff stitch of the binding, and opposite would be a runoff stitch in the pinstripe. Ideally, you want to hide those under the flaps. It's just cosmetic. If you don't, it's no big deal to function, but it's some part that would get repacked because of that. So. I think this needs to go to America. Sorry? I think this needs to go to America. Okay. So you should be able to stand, stand the pilot chute straight up. Anybody pack on a hard floor, a tiled floor, non-carpet, slippy floor? Ever had the rig go away from you really fast and you start to sweat and cry and hopefully someone comes to help? Well, it's going to happen in your career. So if you put your knee on the pin flap, it can't go anywhere. So it's a little thing, but it's a big thing at the same time. And the pop top, push down at the angle of the reserve container. If you push it straight down, it's going to kick out possibly bow, bow, the bit, bow the spring and mess up your bridle and it might actually destroy the pilot chute. So when I look through here, what two things am I looking for? Uh huh. And one more. Yeah, perfect. You think that I couldn't talk when I do this, but I can, so you can't get away from it. So push down and take all the fabric out. Um, this technique I'm going to show you was developed over 20 years ago and it was Dave Ruffle what developed it and uh, it's really a clean way of doing the pilot shoot and I've done them all ever since that. My first time using this bad boy. It's nice. Okay, so make sure the fabric's outside. I find take the pin out before you actually put too much tension on. Most problems occur because of poor technique, um, mechanical advantages being used. And you can see here, if you've got a rigger with a bar this long, his hand's at the top of it, you probably don't want him being your rigger or so. So um, take the pin out if you feel comfortable without too much pressure on it because that will damage the pin, cause nicks in the pin. Every time you pin the cypress loop, it's gonna break it actually. And it will cause dents in the grommets too. And it will cause a memory there. So pull it through, tap, pin. Okay. I don't suggest you turn your stuff around in your loft. It's just uh, no one's watching you in your loft. All right, so from here, I'm gonna put my knee on the back of the pop top. What that's gonna do is kick the pop top up at the front and that's gonna help you. So, put your knee on the pop top, bring the fabric down, under, and around. All the way, so down, under, and around. And just repeat till it's all gone. Like so. Do the same on the opposite side. Bring the fabric across your knee. With your right hand, push the bridle down. With your left hand, don't be lazy. Keep it in the middle of the pack job. If you cheat from the front, you're gonna create bulk and you won't get the result you're looking for. So push the bridle down and just sneak the fabric or the mesh towards you. Be confident because the F111 is gonna follow. There it comes. If you get flash, you can use two fingers. That's for the more advanced technique. Okay, then do the same on this side. If you turn the pin, make sure you put it back. Um, I gave a class recently and the guy didn't, wasn't thinking. When you turn the pin, it closes the loop. It just twists it. And he was turning this pin, it was getting harder and harder. And also the loop's gonna shorten too. So I always remember to put it back where I got it from most of the time. Again, push it down. Don't cheat from the front, come to the side. Okay, 
from here, make a T. Don't pull too much tension because the fabric's going to actually pull tension to where like, tangents are popped up, where it's sewn. You don't want to pull it back out. So make a very loose T. We call this the A, B, C, D, and E. If you saw that slide, what was up, that little teaser, that was this flap. That's all I'm saying. I'm more scared of Pat Thomas than the CIA. <laughs> She's got powers, they don't. Okay. When you pull this one down, push the pop top away from you and help it get to the center because it will move. I've only got one eye, so threading needles and lining things up is tricky, believe me. You should try it. Okay. All right. Again, tap. I put my knee on the edge of the pop top so it doesn't kick up. I want it to be even. Take out the pin. If you notice, I didn't push the pin back in the right direction, which wasn't good. Okay, so leave this out. It's where you want to be at this stage. Then here, you can, for the last time, you can actually look inside and you can see that the red lanyard is going the right direction over the, pop, the, the, the bridle. You can see it's still tied and you can still the loop still intact. If the plastic was broken, if the loop had come off or the thread had disengaged, what would you do? Yeah, start again, for sure. Okay. So here, these are called dog ears. There's a test later. These are called Mickey Mouse ears inside some part. That's what they call them. They look like Mickey Mouse ears. So these dog ears, they're not like flap five and six to get the reserve free bag where it's got to go. They just stop the debris and dust and daily things going into the reserve container. So if you had to wear them down in there, you've probably got something wrong from stage one. They should just slide in quite well. Again, if you let them in beforehand, they're really tricky to get out at this stage. And then I would say a technical tap because you want this to come across. If you guys remember the earlier javelins, before the, pre, the, before the K series, the pre-Ks we call it now, there was a type 12 kind of buffer in here what allowed the flap to come across and hinge differently, which I really love. I mean, I might try and bring it back, but it makes a lot of sense. So to help that come across, just give it a tap so it can lie across a lot better. Take the reserve handle out because when you try and pin, you're fighting all that tension it's like a hose pipe, a big fireman's hose pipe, I guess. It feels like this thing's trying to go where it wants to go. So if you take the handle out, protect the Velcro. Where did I put it? Oh, it's there. Protect the Velcro because it will eat the harness. Even just one time, it's going to affect it. So now I've got control of where this goes. It just takes away some of that pressure. The pin goes in one way only. If it goes through the chamfer side, which is correct, if you twist it, you'll get a straight line through the pin and the, and the rip cord. If you go the opposite way, it'll still work, but you can see the angle is not the same. So it goes one way only. Okay, here we go. I always put my knee back on here because I want the tension to stay, or the, the rig to stay on the floor where I'm at. Take out the pin. Bring it through. Say a prayer. Thank you, mate, that's awesome. Nothing like using new tools for the first time. We just, okay, so. When you take this out, do it gently because friction creates heat, heat creates damage. I've been known in the past just to cut them and pull it off and throw it away, but I have miles and miles and miles of line at my you know, <coughs> office. So 
You guys, um, mandatory, you have to do a pin pull test, is that correct? What's the maximum force allowed on the pin? 22. What about 23? What's the minimum? There is an FAA. There is. I'm not to con contradict you, it's 7, which is really loose. Um, but we're not obliged to actually do a pull test. Um, so we don't. Um, but I've packed many, many rigs. And I did at one point last two years ago. I think I put six in a row. And we have a Peak Force digital scale. And I pulled each one. Only two popped. And it was 16 to 18 pounds. And I always do a wrist test, like a, in, internally for myself. So I know what they feel like. So I, I can tell you when I do this what it's probably at. And it's probably really close. But we're not obliged to actually record that information, which I think you know, could be good. I've seen them at 35 pounds and you can't pull them, you know? So I do this. If I can move the pin a little bit just by turning my wrist, I know it's between 16 and 18. And tomorrow it will go down one or two pounds. It will actually decrease. So the pin goes under the protector. The bridle goes back and like so. Any questions on that part so far? No? Okay, then finally, I just fold the pilot chute. And my goal is to go above the bridle, up against the inside of the A&E, &E, and then down into that hole. Okay, so you're going to see here, we call these tension creases. <laughs> well, that is, if the loop's the correct length, it creates tension, and the A, B, C, D, and the A and E flap do this. They pull down. As they pull down, they touch the side flaps. It creates an actual barrier where you can't see through the rig, and the pilot chute can't escape outside of that doorway as such. So that's what you're looking for. And then finally, just take your paddle and square it off. Because this takes up room where the main risers go into the back pad. So you'll see a stitch row here. That's the back pad line. Do you see that? That's the back pad stitch row. This is the reserve container stitch row. It's about 12 to 14 millimeters. And we want that nice and square for the main risers to sit down inside of. Yeah, that's it. Do you guys have any questions on that? No? Wonderful. Can you finish putting the pilot chute into that pocket before closing the pin? You can. So on the larger ones, <coughs> let's just say from a, a J1 and up, you can. If you've got the room, put it in early and bring it across. You'll find that it's too much to handle because these two bar tacks on the BCD, so your pocket's inside those two points there. So it's a lot to keep contained while you're working with a system with an RSK series. Unless you can find a way of doing it, it's fine. But I don't want to add tools to that process. But on the larger ones, absolutely, like the student rigs, J1s and up, if you can get it in there early, bring it across, bring it across then. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I find most people take a small thing away from what they see today. We didn't do the whole thing. It actually made it a bit trickier, to be honest. But um, don't go home and change the world. Just do a little thing, work with it, see if you like it, if it agrees with you and practice, but don't change everything at once because you won't succeed. Because the first and most important thing is what? Function. So if you know it worked yesterday and you saved your girlfriend's life, don't change it because she'll kill you. So make sure you make sure function, 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 you know? Because you know, we want to get to the same result. But yeah, don't change too much too quick if there's a few things you're looking at. Any questions? Well, I'm always available. I'm here tomorrow. Rob will be here as well. Um, there's, a, I guess, a talk this afternoon, which would be great. Um, and uh, if you ever need anything, give me a call, send me an email, and uh, I'll be happy to help out. Thank you. Thank you very much.